Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Prohibition was a dark period of American history. Gangsters ruled cities across the country, most notably Chicago, where the infamous Al Capone had set up operations. On January 16, 1919, the 18th Amendment was ratified, making it illegal to produce, import, export, transport, or sell alcoholic beverages. Federal, state, and local authorities were charged with enforcing this new law with very little success as underground speakeasies sprang up across the city of Chicago. They were supplied by a network of illegal stills and breweries, many of which were controlled by Al Capone. He also set up an elaborate system to smuggle large quantities of alcohol into the United States from Canada. As a result of all this, liquor flowed freely in Chicago during the nearly 14 years that prohibition was in effect. To protect, to protect his enterprise, Al Capone used corruption schemes to prevent any major losses or stoppages to his operations. He did so by generously bribing federal agents, police officers, judges, politicians, and city leaders who then looked the other way. He used fear and threats also to coerce cooperation and those who refused to comply with Capone's demands often found themselves looking down the barrel of a Thompson submachine gun. The federal government, being fully aware of Capone's racketeering, devised a plan to bring the gangster to justice. The Bureau of Investigation appointed Elliot Ness as the chief agent of a task force to arrest and convict Al Capone. But with so many federal and local law enforcement agents on Capone's payroll, Ness set out to put together a list of agents who were upright and who could be trusted, agents who could not be corrupted by organized crime. Of the 300 federal agents, Elliot Ness selected nine of them, plus himself, to accomplish the assignment. These men were above being corrupted by Capone, which earned them the title of the Untouchables. By 1932, they had put Al Capone behind bars and cleaned up the streets of Chicago, and in the end, good triumphed over evil. During the tribulation, there will be a group of people who will be God's untouchables. The 144,000 will believe in the true Christ and will not be influenced by the satanic corruption and organized crime of that day, they will faithfully bear the fearful persecution and threats of the Antichrist, and they will endure to the end of the tribulation. Revelation 14.1 reads, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. The content of chapter 14 is par parenthetical. It's a parenthetical interlude. The scene which we see does not take up the next events in the tribulation in its chronological order, but rather it jumps ahead to the beginning of the millennial kingdom to explain something in light of chapter 13. Because things look bleak in chapter 13 after the rising up of the beast to power, his assassination, his blasphemy of God, and persecution of the saints after he rises again. And then the false prophet's requirement for all to worship the image of the beast and to take his mark to be able to buy and sell. Therefore, the vision of the Lamb standing on Mount Zion is to give hope to the believing and beleaguered of that day who will use this book as their guidebook in that day. Because here John sees the ultimate triumph of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, following his second coming. Both Jerusalem and the Temple Mount are referred to as Zion, in, or Mount Zion in the Scriptures. And Zion was chosen by God to be His dwelling place on the earth. As Psalm 132 states, For the Lord hath chosen Zion, 
He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. In the middle of the tribulation, Zion will be corrupted by the man of sin, the Antichrist, who will defile the temple at that time when he goes into the temple in Jerusalem and declares that he is the Messiah and God in the flesh. And also the false prophet will erect the image of the beast and place that idol in the temple. But here in John's vision, Christ is seen standing on Mount Zion after his second coming, showing that he has overcome the Antichrist and triumphed over his kingdom of darkness and has begun his righteous earthly reign on Mount Zion. The Lamb is seen standing on Mount Zion, and with him are 144,000 followers, all of whom were sealed on their foreheads. These are mentioned because they stand in such stark contrast to the worshipers of the beast in chapter 13 who willingly take his mark in their foreheads and sell themselves out to the idolatrous and cultic system of the beast, and they willingly worship him as God. But who are these 144,000? And to answer that question, we got to look back to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 8 read, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Asher were, were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Nephthalim were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Zabulon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. We are currently living in an unprophesied program of God's grace toward all nations. After the church, the body of Christ is raptured and taken out of this world to heaven, God will return to his program with Israel and will fulfill all his promises to her. In the book of Revelation, Israel is the focus of this prophecy. You see that in identifying who the 144,000 is. Revelation chapter 6 closes with a question. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The answer is found in chapter 7. And chapter 7 is a parenthesis, which gives an explanation of all those who will be saved during the coming tribulation period, and it begins with the 144,000. In verses 1 to 3, we read of four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. This is equivalent to the four points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. These four angels are given power over the elements of nature. All the earth's winds from these four directions will be turned off by these angels. And an eerie and deathly stillness will then envelop the globe. Another angel, having the seal of the living God, instructs the four angels not to unleash, uh, not to unleash their judgments till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. First, we learn that this group of people will be sealed in their foreheads. Second, that they will be servants of our God. Third, that their number will be 144,000. Fourth, that they will all be Jews of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And fifth, that there will be 12,000 Jews from each of the tribes of Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, 
Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. This group of 144,000 from the tribes of Israel will be converted after the rapture of the church, very early on in the seven-year tribulation, through the ministry of the two witnesses. The angel says that they will be sealed in their foreheads. And Revelation 14, 1 says that the 144,000 will have the Father's name written in their foreheads. This seal of God containing God's name in some manner on their forehead show that they have believed in Jesus Christ, God's Son, as the Messiah, and they belong to God and not to the beast, and that they have the guarantee of God's protection and security in and throughout the tribulation. You see an example of that security when the fifth trumpet sounds in Revelation and the bottomless pit opens releasing locusts which will torment men with a scorpion-like sting for five months. The locusts are commanded to hurt only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Those with the seal of God will be protected by God from that torment. The 144,000 will be supernaturally protected from the torments of the tribulation. They'll be protected from persecution of the Antichrist and protected from Satan's attempts to destroy them. They will endure the hardships and survive the duration of the tribulation, and they will enter the thousand-year earthly reign of Christ. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute, but first we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Revelation Volume 4 is a 250-page hardcover commentary written by Pastor Paul M. Sadler and Pastor Kevin Sadler. In the final volume of this series on Revelation, we'll be studying chapters 20 through 22. These final chapters detail the binding of Satan for a thousand years, the battle of Gog and Magog, the great white throne, and the new Jerusalem and eternal state for the saints of prophecy. To order your copy, contact Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at BereanBibleSociety.org. Receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight. Call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. The 144,000 are sealed for a specific purpose, to be servants of God as verse 3 states, and as they serve God, they will be godly witnesses and evangelists, calling people to repentance, water baptism, and faith in Jesus Christ as the true Messiah. They will use the gospel records to reach people with the gospel of the kingdom. The gospels clearly identify Jesus Christ as God's Son and Israel's Messiah. And people will need in that day to trust in Christ's name and identity to be saved during the tribulation. Matthew 24, 14 states, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And with the two witnesses, these 144,000 witnesses, will proclaim the gospel of the kingdom unto all nations. And as a result, John observes in verse 9 of this chapter, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations. He sees them in heaven. By this, we see that they will have a very powerful evangelistic ministry. A large company of those that they will lead to Christ are seen as martyred saints in heaven, serving before the throne of God in the rest of chapter 7. But the fact that the 144,000 are not seen in heaven with all these other martyrs teaches how they will be preserved, kept safe, protected from death. And then in chapter 14, you find them standing triumphantly with the Lamb on Mount Zion in the millennium. 
The 144,000 will be actual Jewish men from the line of Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. The tribes of Dan and Ephraim are not mentioned from the original 12 tribes of Israel with Levi taking the place of Dan and Joseph taking the place of Ephraim in the list. Their omission may be due to these tribes being heavily involved in idolatry in their past. Also, the Antichrist will be a Jew, and it is very possible that he will come from the tribe of Dan because of Jacob's prophecy regarding Dan and his descendants. Genesis 49, 17 reads, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse, horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. Likened to a serpent as the tribe of Dan, the Antichrist will cause many to fall backward in Israel by his deception. And another unique feature in the list is that Judah is listed first rather than Reuben, who was the firstborn of Jacob. And that likely has to do with the fact that the true Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the descendant of Judah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. No one becomes part of the 144,000 today under grace. We become members of the church, the body of Christ, when we trust the gospel of grace by faith alone that Christ died for our sins and rose again. And in that church, we have a heavenly hope and a heavenly citizenship. The 144,000 are physical descendants of Abraham. They are Jewish saints who will be saved during the early part of the tribulation through the ministry of the two witnesses following the rapture of the body of Christ. Revelation 14, 2 and 3 read, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. After Christ returns at his second coming and establishes his kingdom, he will stand in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, with this group of believers from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. The 144,000 are the same 144,000 mentioned in chapter 7. And as a testament to God's sovereignty and faithfulness, they are seen with Christ in his kingdom on Mount Zion. Observing this vision on the earth, John hears a song from a voice from heaven. The voice is described as a voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. John also hears the voice of harpers harping with their harps. The voice heard is described in majestic terms to portray heaven's response to what John saw here with Christ in Mount Zion with 144,000 after the conclusion of the tribulation and his triumph over the Antichrist. At first glance, it might appear to be the voice of God because God's voice is described in Revelation and in other scriptures as the sound of many waters and of thunder. But the song is sung before the throne of God, verse 3 states, and they, plural, sing it. We get a clue later as to who John was hearing at the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. Revelation 19, 6 reads, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. The voice of a great multitude there sounded like many waters and thunder, and I believe John was hearing a great multitude from heaven here as well. This voice of this great multitude in heaven was one voice, meaning that they will be one in mind and heart and singular in their praise. By process of elimination, who is not singing is the four beasts. It's not the 24 elders before the throne. 
And it is not the 144,000 because we are only told that they can learn the song that they heard. The great multitude is likely the great multitude found back in Revelation 7, verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. The heavenly choir singing before the throne here, I believe, is the martyred saints of the tribulation, in contrast to the 144,000 who are on earth and will not suffer martyrdom. Verse 3 states that they sang a new song, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. The song is that of victory after conflict with Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. It has never been sung before, for such a conflict had never been fought before. Therefore, it's new. And it is a song only the 144,000 could learn and understand. They were the only ones who could truly appreciate what that song expressed because both groups, the 144,000 on earth, the martyred saints in heaven, will have experienced the severe trials of the tribulation. And both groups alone are worthy to enter into a song of redemption recounting God's victory over their enemies in the tribulation. Like in chapter 7, the 144,000 on the earth are mentioned, and then the chapter takes you to heaven, to the great multitude of martyrs. Likewise, here in chapter 14, the 144,000 are mentioned on Mount Zion, and then the chapter takes you to heaven, to the martyrs again. Revelation 14, 4 and 5 read, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The 144,000 will all be unmarried Jewish virgin men. There's no reason not to take what John says here anything but literally. These ministers of the gospel of the kingdom will not have ever engaged in sexual relations with women. In Matthew 19, 12, our Lord taught, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there, were, there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. What we are being taught here is that the 144,000 will choose to remain virgins so that they will be able to devote every fiber of their being to the Lamb for the kingdom of heaven's sake. The heavy burden and responsibility of their ministry during these seven years will be demanding and urgent, and they will devote themselves fully to it and give everything they have to carrying out the Great Commission in that day. As John says, these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. As the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7.32, He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. The whole group of 144,000 will be faithful to follow the Lord Jesus Christ following Him in unquestioning obedience, single-minded devotion. They will follow the Lamb wherever He leads them throughout the tribulation period, caring only for how they may please Him. They will be unwaveringly loyal to Him, whatever the cost. John also states of the 144,000, These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. The 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel will be the first fruits of the two witnesses at the very beginning of the tribulation. First fruits refers to the first part of a crop to be gathered, implying a much larger harvest to come. And in the tribulation, the 144,000 are instrumental in God's plan in the harvest of souls during the tribulation, as after their conversion, 
many more follow. First fruits was also that which was offered to God as an expression of being totally separated and set apart to Him as an offering and a sacrifice to God. And by the 144,000 being called first fruits, this teaches how they give their lives completely unto God and to the Lamb as a holy and pure offering. Finally, the 144,000 are described in verse 5, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The term guile means deceit. When Nathanael came to meet the Lord, John 1:47 states, our Lord said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. This is how the 144,000 will be as well. These witnesses will speak the truth accurately, precisely, in a time when deception will abound, as the tribulation will be characterized by deceit and lies and counterfeits and lying wonders. But these 144,000 will be men of truth. Their tongues belong completely to speaking the Word of God, the gospel of the kingdom, the truth of Christ and who He is. And having no guile in their mouth as they follow the Lord, they'll be just like their Lord. 1 Peter 2.22 says of Christ, neither was guile found in His mouth. They will be without deceit and without fault before the throne of God. Their lives, their testimonies will be blameless and above reproach They'll be without fault because they will refuse the mark of the beast. They will refuse to be corrupted by Satan, temptation, or the wickedness of that day. The example of the 144,000 teach us many principles that are in line with our instructions under grace, such as being a living sacrifice, speaking the truth in love, being blameless, serving the living and true God and holding forth the word of life. As we live in such a way before the world today, we, we will be a compelling testimony for Christ in the gospel as the 144,000 will be in the future. God's most effective witnesses to this dark world are those who not only share the light of truth, but also walk as children of light. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.